Okay, my name is Robert Laurie, and I've been asked to uh, fill in for Jay Martin, who uh, his wife is pregnant, and they are um, off at the hospital. And my background, I'm a, uh, well, I'm a quite well-known cannabis lawyer, and uh, I'm a board advisor with the Multidisciplinary Association of Psychedelic Studies, that's known as MAPS Canada. And so to have uh, Hamilton with us today is truly exciting. So again, thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. So I was a little bit curious about what in this area would be interesting to investors. And I think Jay wanted to talk specifically about the psychedelics that have actually entered into clinical use thus far and the ones that present some opportunity for investors. Um, and really, there's only four psychedelics that have been commercialized in the 21st century to any serious extent, and those are Ibogaine, Ketamine, MDMA, and Psilocybin. Um, and you would know more about the legality concerning all these substances in Canada than I would, but um, there's certainly been a move with all of them except for Ibogaine to get them into a place where clinics can operate in the United States. And there's a lot of interest in business opportunities in that sphere um, and a lot of concern as well. It seems that the, the general trend is that psychedelics are following the same path that cannabis took maybe a decade ago. Right, let me just, a uh, quick question. How many in the audience have heard of Ibogaine? Oh, yeah, so not bad an enormous at all. number. All right, well, for those that aren't too aware, take us through a little bit of a brief intro on what is Ibogaine, where is it from, and uh, some of the uses, and then I guess we could look at legalities at that after. Well, it seems like almost everyone already knew, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's a plant, well, Iboga is a plant that grows in Central and West Africa, and what's interesting about Ibogaine and actually really everything that I've named previously is that it already had a medical history that has sort of predated this contemporary revival. Um, it was used as a pharmaceutical in France under the name Lamborghini. People recognized its therapeutic activity as a stimulant. At low doses, it's actually not psychedelic at all. It just has a stimulating effect that would probably be about, it, it's closer to amphetamine than it is to LSD qualitatively. Um, and then as you increase the dose, it actually becomes a sedative and it starts to exert a certain anti-addictive effect that has been found particularly useful in treatment of opioid dependence. Um, so that's the, the basic story. Um, the way that this was discovered was somewhat serendipitous. There was a heroin addict named Howard Lotsoff who took Ibogaine after a chemist friend gave it to him in the 60s and he recognized that not only did he have no desire <clears throat> to use heroin anymore after using this drug, um, he started to associate heroin with death and found it sort of unappealing as an idea, but it wasn't just a, a psychological change. He also found that he wasn't suffering any of the, the typical withdrawal symptoms that accompany cessation of opioid use. And that's really what makes Ibogaine so remarkable is that you have this dual effect. You have the, the psychological anti-addictive effect that's wow. present in many psychedelics, but then there also is a, a physical anti-addictive effect that is mediated by the opioid activity of some Ibogaine metabolites. Interesting, and just on a note in terms of legality in Canada, uh, as of May 19th, 2017, Ibogaine has been added to the pre prescription drug list that's or known as the PDL with Health Canada. And uh, so under the food and drug regs, it's still not authorized for use, but it's interesting that the, well, the feds at Health Canada added it to the PDL for the reason of reducing or to mitigate potential harms. So what do you think about that statement of ibogaine and being put on the PDL simply to mitigate potential harm? 
Well, I'm a, I'm a bit confused about the legality because, you know, it, it's been illegal in the United States for decades and never really had much of a chance there. So the, the Ibogaine clinics have traditionally been located in Canada or in Mexico, and people cross the border in both directions in order to get treatment. And um, there have been a number of problems with that. One is that because you have a lot of people from the United States traveling out of the country, they want to get their treatment as quickly as possible. And the idea is that even if it's ideal to stagger the doses and take a lower dose over a longer period of time, people can't afford to do that, so they start using these ultra-high doses that in some instances are fatal. So that's you know one of many problems that emerges in a, a prohibitionist market. Um, but the other problem is that a lot of the administrators on both sides of the border have been somewhat unscrupulous, and it's made it a little bit difficult to collect rigorous data on how effective of a therapy this truly is. Right. Now, if, we, if you'd like to, how about we look at ketamine? Tell us a little bit about ketamine. Uh, yeah, well, ketamine, and I imagine if you're familiar with Ibogaine, everyone here is even more familiar with ketamine. So, uh, But ketamine is interesting because it, unlike these other substances that we've mentioned, it's already in widespread use internationally. According to the right. World Health Organization, it is the most widely used anesthetic on earth, period. Um, I think a lot of people think it's a club drug or that it's only used in veterinary medicine, but that's simply not the case. It's well, I was used reading it's for maintaining and starting and maintaining anesthesia. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's an extremely useful, short-acting anesthetic. So, and, and that's a huge advantage because what's happening right now in the United States is both anesthesiologists and psychiatrists have recognized that they can start these little uh, boutique practices where they administer ketamine to depressed people, and it's actually a very lucrative market, uh, because unlike traditional psychedelic psychotherapy, where a trained psychologist or administrator has to sit with the patient for the duration of the experience at these ketamine clinics, sometimes they just hook someone up to a drip and leave them in a room to dissociate, and they can do five or 10 patients simultaneously this way. I'm not saying that that's a good thing, but that is the way that it is done in some locations in the United States. Well, the legal situation of ketamine in Canada is that it's a class one under the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, the CDSA, which schedule one is uh, up there along with cocaine, morphine, methadone, and codeine. So what, what are your thoughts about ketamine being in such company of these other harder substances? Well, I'm not even sure I believe in the hard, soft substance dichotomy to begin with. Um, and, you know, I think that there's one of the most problematic ideas in the way that the United States classifies certain drugs. They have Schedule One, which is the most restrictive legal schedule, and that is for drugs that have no medicinal use. Well, that's just an absurd idea. I think that there is a medicinal use for almost everything, and if there isn't, it just has yet to be discovered. And it's a very short-sighted way of thinking about these substances to assume that anything can or can't be used medicinally. So, you know, I, I would I would hesitate to say what it should be. You know, what would be the best company for ketamine in the United States? It's Schedule Three, which makes it less restricted than even something like Ritalin. Um, which is good. I think that that's appropriate. And one reason for that is because of its widespread medical use. I don't know, what was it, what was class one you said? Well, yeah, Colette's is what I was uh, surprised to see that, uh, yeah, it's class one or schedule one under the CDSA, which like the United States is questionable medicinal value, which was the traditional reason for a number of substances being put on the controlled list. But in that, in that case, um, I mean, w what would you then say to uses of ketamine for treatment? What would be some of the uh, more common conditions? Well, one thing that's really probably the most interesting thing about ketamine is when you look at traditional treatments for depression, they have about a two-week lag before the therapeutic effect manifests. So if somebody's very depressed and you start them on a, a typical SSRI 
treatment, um, they may not experience any relief from their depression for two weeks, which is quite a long time. With ketamine, the relief is immediate and can last two wow. weeks after a single injection, sometimes longer. So that's a huge advantage that is not to be underestimated. The flip side is that ketamine has a number of problems that are not present in the SSRI antidepressants. In some patients, it's addictive. It's been associated with a certain type of bladder toxicity. And, um, and there's even maybe some indication that under certain circumstances, it can be neurotoxic. So I think that it's important to think of these substances as a starting point. You know, ketamine is not a natural substance and there's nothing like it found in nature, but in the case of psilocybin and ibogaine, um, these are natural products and we're very lucky to have found them in nature and even luckier that there are traditional societies that use them that help us evaluate their safety and know that, because if you can look to a, a traditional group and say, look, they've been using this for tens, hundreds, maybe even thousands of years, that gives you a sense that maybe this stuff isn't so bad. Um, Correct. Well, and, that's a nice segue then into psilocybin. Right. And, uh, well, just to note, that's a Schedule 3 under the Controlled Drug Substances Act in Canada, which so, is so up ketamine there. ketamine is more restricted than psilocybin in Canada? Is that right? Am I that, understanding that correctly? That's what uh, my uh, review of this has concluded. I mean, Schedule 3 is where you find LSD, DMT, PCP, and amphetamine. It, is it reversed in its restrictiveness so that the higher the number, the more restrictive? Some of it seems to be quite arbitrary as okay. to what the folks that put it on the list, their intentions. I mean, that's certainly the case. Cannabis is currently scheduled too. We do have a legal medicinal use at the moment or medicinal use is provided for. And then of course, October 17th is the big day of legalization. But Let's look a little bit to what's going on in the uses with uh, psilocybin. And uh, is it depression that the applications are, are being used for or anxiety? Tell us a little more. Yeah, more. Well, 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 like Ibogaine, um, there's a sort of prehistory with psilocybin that can bo both clinically and traditionally. So you have traditional use by the Mazatec people in Oaxaca and depending on how long it's been used there for at least hundreds of years. And then you have the psychedelic resurgence in the 60s that occurred where a lot of work was done on psilocybin as a treatment for addiction, specifically alcoholism. Um, and then you have the current resurgence where people are now broadening the scope of the potential applications. They're looking at smoking cessation. They're looking at obsessive compulsive disorder. And they're looking at depression. And in all of the different disorders that have been tested, the results have been extremely impressive. I mean, astonishing, really. Or, or not astonishing, depending on how you want to think about it. Because right. in some sense, you could say, well, we knew this all along. This has been in the medical literature for decades. Of course, this stuff works. And really, it's a tragedy that we didn't get back to this sooner. But um, so, yeah, that, that's the, the current landscape with psilocybin. But you know, there's, there's a lot of controversy, especially with psilocybin right now. Um, and a company called Compass Pathways that is associated with Peter Thiel and a lot of people in the psychedelic community are afraid that this represents the first step sure. in a sort of corporate commodification of the psychedelic experience. And it's really, um, there's a lot of debate. There's a lot of hearsay that I don't want to spread without even understanding it because while researching this subject, I actually had a lot of difficulty finding concrete information on exactly what it is that Compass Pathways is doing. Uh, but they are, I don't know what the, the equivalent in the cannabis world would have been, but they are sort of the first corporate step in the direction of, well, what is it going to look like for white collar business people to get involved in the psychedelic sphere? It's a, a similar analogy to cannabis because you have a lot of the larger licensed producers as they're known and you have at the other end of the spectrum the craft grower and a lot of people are fearing that these larger corporations are pushing out the craft grower and will be attempting to utilize the health benefits of cannabis um, 
in a more restrictive fashion as opposed to an, an open source approach. And I could see there being the same issues with the psychedelics. This is, again, compounds and substances that are found in nature, which through big corporations, science grants, and so on, are able to privatize and commoditize something that arguably sh should be accessible on a, on a greater basis. Right. Right, yeah, and it, there's so many questions, and one is a, a basic question of fairness, because, you know, I think there are a lot of people in the cannabis world who felt that they had sacrificed their freedom, people who had gone to prison. 100%. People who were activists, people who had dedicated their lives to the plant, and then they felt that these newcomers, these business people came and reaped all the benefits of their hard work. But the flip side is that that sort of white-collar, corporate interest, I think, had a, a really important role in pushing cannabis toward legalization. So there's a push and pull there that's important to recognize, and which makes me somewhat reluctant to outright dismiss companies like Compass Pathways, because who's to say that that isn't what ultimately pushes things toward the direction of legality, and that would have a, a positive impact on everyone? You, that's a fair statement, and uh, I guess what you're saying is that we have to look at all new situations with an open mind, but at the same time, ask the questions. Yeah. Excellent. Well, let's turn to then another favorite, uh, MDMA, or methylene dioxymethamphetamine, or known as ecstasy. Tell us a little bit about that, and... Uh, your thoughts and applications and the utility of essentially something that's been known as for decades as a party drug. Right. And, it, you know, again, it, it's very interesting because these drugs are very well established, very profitable commodities. The MDMA trade is a multi million dollar international trade. There's an enormous market for this drug. And I think that most people, at least in the drug world, understand that the barrier between medical and non medical use is a lot more permeable than people recognize. You know, you, you look at people saying, oh, look, it turns out that MDMA is really useful for PTSD. Well, who's to say that a lot of these people that would have previously been categorized as uh, abusers or recreational users weren't also use trying to exploit that same therapeutic effect that's being observed in these clinical trials. So um, what we're seeing is that, like all of the previously mentioned substances, MDMA has really miraculous effects when studied clinically, particularly for PTSD. And that's just the beginning. You know, right now, everything is a bit sensitive. And I think that MAPS, correct me if I'm wrong, has chosen some of the safer things to do because the stakes are high. Everyone wants to succeed. You don't want to uh, do something too bizarre. For example, it's very likely that MDMA will work for PTSD, and it has worked. It's worked very, very well. And then after that is demonstrated, then you move down to maybe something else. Who knows what that might be? Depression or bipolar or borderline personality disorder or who knows what. Things that maybe the chances of succeeding are a little bit lower, but it's still, these are important areas to explore. And on top of that, um, you know, I think it's really important to, to recognize the basic science aspect of all of this is there's so much emphasis on the clinical applications, but people rarely discuss the, the basic science, the chemistry and the pharmacology that underlie all these substances because, you know, and I started to say this earlier, you know, Ibogaine is an absolutely amazing substance, but it has flaws. And there's different ways of addressing those flaws. The same is true of MDMA, the same is true of ketamine, and the same is probably true of psilocybin. I'll just name those flaws very quickly. Psilocybin is potentially, although I don't, I don't want to emphasize this too much, there's some indication that it might be cardiotoxic if used daily. Ketamine is potentially toxic to the bladder, and both MDMA and ketamine potentially have some neurotoxicity, and Ibogaine has this cardiotoxic effect. Well, who's to say that those... We could, we could develop therapeutic strategies that minimize the risk associated with those potential toxicities, or we could modify the substances and see if there are things that can be done to eliminate them. And that's where basic science comes in. You know, Ibogaine is a great lead compound to modify and see how it can be optimized, how the anti-addictive effect can be optimized. Right. 
No, I mean, that's, uh, it, it, it is something that I, at least I can appreciate from working as a drug policy lawyer and litigator in the space that it seems that the biggest obstacles and challenges facing these substances at the same time are the same people that are seeking to regulate. So I guess what can we all do in terms of developing a greater understanding and being in a position to bridge the gaps between these various groups? I and mean, what are some of the thoughts and ways of bridging and broaching the topic of psychedelics with our family doctor or healthcare providers or our local governments, because it is a topic that's going to require, I think, greater constructive engagement. And uh, I'd be grateful for your thoughts and tips on how to do that successfully. Yeah, I mean, it's that's a big question. And, you know, there's a lot of different answers to it. One is, you know, just grassroots uh, activism and education and telling your friends, telling your parents, telling the, the people around you that maybe these things are worth looking at carefully. Maybe they aren't the way that you previously thought about them. I mean, Michael Pollan recently wrote a great book that I'm sure many people it's here a have fabulous seen, book. if not read. And that book, you couldn't ask for anything more in terms of just making a very solid case that says, give you know, acknowledge this as a possibility at the very least because the evidence is there. These things really do help certain people under certain circumstances and to dismiss them could deny people not only a very valuable treatment strategy but maybe the most effective treatment. Excellent, yeah. Well, so that's part of it. The other thing is that the media plays a huge role. And how so? Because journalists are sculptors of public opinion for better or worse and when you look at the way, for example, synthetic cannabinoids are popularly perceived, they're considered horrifying, scare substances. Oh, I wouldn't, you couldn't <laughs> get, make me take one of those for a thousand dollars. It's going to turn me into a zombie. I'm going to eat my best friend's face. That's the way people think about synthetic cannabinoids because that's the way they're depicted in the media. And that's also because there's no move to defend them. There's nobody standing up for their potential therapeutic activity. So right now it's a really lucky time in that there's a certain synergy between the medical clinical research and journalists working together to emphasize the positive aspects of these substances and it's created an amazing momentum and i think it's important to keep that momentum by being responsible by not overemphasizing the positives and not neglecting to mention the potential negative effects because um you know, if everybody is a, you see this a lot in the cannabis world, people will say that cannabis cures all diseases. Well, cannabis is an amazing plant with amazing potential. I think it might be a bit of a stretch to say that it cures all diseases. And, you know, you want to just be a little bit careful about the way that you present these things because there's a lot at stake. And, you know, the fact that we were pretty close to recognizing these things as medicines at one point in the 60s and then it all fell apart should be a reminder that... Yeah. No matter how much momentum we have right now, if we're not careful, um, it can fall apart again. So it's important to behave responsibly and do the best that you can to educate those around you. Right on. Well, that's, a, I think, a very, very good answer to a difficult question. Um, let's conclude on and look at the area of 2008. We had a financial crisis. We're presently in the middle of an opioid crisis. Uh, I can't think of a better backdrop for psychedelics. Uh, I mean, are your thoughts, what are your thoughts for the, the role that psychedelics can play in the opioid crisis and, and your experience with that? Because Vancouver, just to bring conflict, context, we're in the middle of a major opioid crisis. The downtown east side's considered the worst zip code in Canada. And we're starting to see more and more of these traditional approaches. But I'd like to hear from your point of view what you've been seeing on the front lines and and so on. Yeah, I think the potential is there, but it's, it's a lot of work and it's maybe more work than most people want to put in. For example, there's a, a psychedelic called 5-MeO-DMT. Maybe some of you are familiar with it. It's present in the secretion or venom of a, of a toad. And, uh, <laughs> and there was a gynecologist who I was friends with who would give it to methamphetamine addicts and it was very effective but he stopped doing it. And I said, why'd you stop? And he said, it's just too much work. 
it's too much work dealing with these people. They're all messed up. You have to then help them get their life back together. Even if it gets them off of the methamphetamine temporarily, it's, a, it's almost a full-time job to help these people. I'd rather just improve the lives of people who are already well. And I'm in no position to tell him to do anything, you know, so that's fine. That was his choice. But I think what that says is even if the therapeutic activity is there, even if the possibility exists, you need people who care so much that they want to put in the work to help people. And that's not something to be underestimated. So with Ibogaine, I mean, Ibogaine is a drug with a very long duration. Um, depending on exactly how it's administered, it could result in a multi-day trip. That requires an enormous... <laughs> Someone laugh at that? Yeah, I know there was some audience <laughs> participation there. <laughs> well, okay, fair enough. But, uh, but, you know, that requires an enormous amount of commitment on the part of the therapist or the administrator. Um, if you're paying a therapist full time to sit with someone for 48 plus hours while they're undergoing a, an extremely powerful experience while withdrawing from opioids, that's not to be underestimated. And on top of that, the same people that need this most are people that aren't going to have a lot of money. So it's not a profitable realm to enter. So you need, you know, it's, it's almost charity work and it's hard charity work. Right. So the potential is there, but you need very committed administrators who are willing to put in the effort to help people. Right. Now, we've talked a lot about psychedelics and the science of, of these substances. Let's wrap up a little bit here with what's, what does the future hold for you and uh, where do we go from here? Well, I think that things are looking pretty good. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about the way things are heading. And I, and I hope that everyone behaves responsibly. And I hope that Compass Pathways doesn't turn out to be the malevolent corporate entity that some people in the psychedelic community seem to think that they are. Um, and I hope that the, the basic science continues because that's really where I think that there's going to be a lot to be learned. You know, it's already happened in subtle ways that people aren't entirely aware of. Um, anyone here that's uh, has migraine headaches is probably familiar with a, a I class. Do. You do? Yeah, I do, do you know about the triptans? I've heard a bit about this, but it's something that I would like greater access to. What? Triptan? Yes. Well, 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 you might be thinking of something else, but there's a whole class of anti-migraine drugs called triptans. If you look triptans. at the molecular structure of these compounds, they're all related to 5-MeO-DMT. And I don't think it's a coincidence. Um, you know, pharmaceutical companies... Um, have noticed that there are therapeutic effects in a lot of these serotonergic compounds and there's been an effort to strip the psychedelic activity while maintaining either the anti-addictive effect or the anti-headache effect or the anti-this effect or that effect. And I don't think that's a bad thing either. I think that there are people that don't want to undergo what could be a traumatic or difficult psychedelic experience and it's important to continuously research these things to see how their therapeutic activity can be optimized. So I would, um, I think it's really important all of the work that MAPS is doing and I think supporting them is a, is a great place to start but I also hope that everybody recognizes that a lot of the medicines that are being used right now are a starting place. They're not the end and there's a lot to be discovered in this area. Well, listen, I th think it's been absolutely brilliant having you in Vancouver. It's been amazing learning and experiencing the depth of your passion for this topic. And I think that this room has certainly learned a lot more about the applications of something as far out as psychedelic medicine. And so, ladies and gentlemen, on that note, would you please put your hands together and give a big round of applause for our guest, Mr. <laughs> Hamilton Morris. Thank you very much. Thanks, I everyone. I think that's all we have time for.